you know, I do more consulting role. It's I, I say I'm like, I'm never a coach because I'm the one that you're going to bring in and you're going to be like, hey, we're at X and we want to go to X. And for anyone listening that's an entrepreneur, like it's actually pretty easy to grow your business. Like you're either going to acquire new customers, you're going to get your existing customers to buy more from you. You're going to exi- get your existing customers to buy from you more frequently. And those two things are a lot cheaper than the first or you're going to raise your prices like all roads run through that and it just depends on where you are do you have a customer acquisition strategy or are you just posting and hoping on the internet and allowing people to do word of mouth but there's no strategy behind it what it is brad lee back again with another episode of drop bombs today in the studio folks as always i got a real treat for you Candy Valentino's in the house. Hi, Brad. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Now, listen, Valentino, is that an Italian name? That is, yes. And that's your real last name? Yes. Because that sure sounds fancy. So I, I can show you my driver's license. <laughs> is, your, is your middle name Dandy? No. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been great? No, that would be. Candy Dandy Valentino? It's already bad enough with Candy. Candy Valentino, best-selling author, business growth expert, and financial analyst. You started your first business before you could even order a drink. Yeah. Where were you, 19? 19. What business was that? I started spas before they were like a thing, salon and spas with massages and facials and all that stuff. Really? Yeah. Were they successful? Yeah. Yeah. You know, one day I said, I want to start a salon Mm -hmm. called Felonies. Okay. And it was going to be treatment so good, it should be illegal. (laughs) I love it. That's really good. And, you know, massage chairs while you're waiting, shoulder rubs. Like I go to this place, it's not a fancy place, but every time they're done cutting your hair, they'll just knock out a quick shoulder rub. Yeah. I'll I'll be like, you know, I'll give you 50. Just keep doing that. Exactly. It's the best part. (laughs) Yeah. So it's like, you know, there's little things you can do at these salons that'll just like make them stand out. Not just the the stylist, but the freaking services. That's all we did. And then I was going to obviously have some tanning beds and tanning booths in there and then sell um, bikinis. Okay. Because, you know, it's what, five, ten dollars worth of material? Yeah. They have great margins. Great margins. We had and tanning it, beds when they were out. Like, they, then they went out of style, so we... Are they out now? Yeah. Well, this is fresh from Necker Island. <laughs> this is not a tanning bed color. But... If I am doing something, I think tan fat looks better than white fat. I agree. So I don't know that they're out, are they? Well, they're not because there was a lot of studies. That's why we pulled them out. So they started, you had to have a lot of liability insurance because of all of the skin cancers. Oh, I'm talking about like spray tan too. Oh, spray tan. That's totally in. No, I mean, back in the 90s, we had tanning bed. Yeah, we had tanning beds. There are beds where I go spray tan sometimes, but I don't even spray. Like one time I bought a a, a membership to where it's like I could do it as often as I wanted, but I found myself doing it once every couple of months anyway. Exactly. And plus I'm from Vegas, so it's always sunny here and we usually get tan by ourselves. So it was a spa. And did you sell those? Yeah. And then you just kept doing business after that? So in the midst of all of that, right, because once I developed customers and figured all of this out because I I got an SBA loan. I had a six week run rate to figure it out. I had seven employees to start and I had 45 days where I was going to be out of money (laughs) because I didn't come from money. I grew up in a trailer. So I just had to figure this out. Did you grow up in a trailer? Mm -hmm. Where at? Yeah. In Pennsylvania. Yeah. So my dad has a, had an eighth grade education. My mom dropped out in ninth grade to have me. Um, and so life was more about survival, right? So starting a business in the late nineties for a female that wasn't married, you know, everybody would come in and be like, where's your husband, you know, or where's your, where's your dad? And I'm like, nope, it's just me. And so I had to figure out really quickly how to build a business and I had a lot of leverage to do it. And then what I realized was the customers would come in and they would ask like, what do you have on your hair and what skincare and what lip gloss is that? So then I just started making our own products and having candles and body scrubs. And then we went into jewelry and all these different lines because we already had a built in audience, but this was all, this wasn't like perfected this was all just kind of happened so I was doing that got got some success by my early 20s and then started a nonprofit in order to give back so in those 20 some years before I exited I had a lot of different businesses and lines of revenues and things that I got involved in and then I was real estate investing I got my first property when I was 20 in a foreclosure so I was doing real estate investing through those 20 years too so you you had those spas all the whole time Mm mm-hmm 20 years from 1999 
to two till 2019. I wanted to be done by the time I was 40. Mm. That was my goal. That's wonderful. That's why. So you've learned a lot. I've learned. That's a lot. what makes you the best-selling author and business growth expert that you are. What about the financial analyst? So fin the financial analyst is more about business finance, right? That's kind of my strength. That's what I found I really was good at was where a lot of people were focusing on maybe sales or, or team or, or different avenues inside of business. What I realized I was really good at was the numbers and what every good business has in common is they know their data, they know their KPIs, they know their metrics, and they know their numbers. They understand business finance. All decisions in business should really run through those two avenues, data yeah. and numbers. And so I realized really quickly that I was good at it and I love that. I love it. And then I was taking that same talent that I guess I developed and I was applying it into investing. So then I started investing in properties, long-term holds, short-term holds, Airbnbs, flips, you name it. And was doing that among while I was running the business. Still no husband. Uh, I got married in there somewhere. Yeah. All right, so husband and got now. divorced in there. <laughs> yeah. No husband anymore. No, no husband now. <laughs> so you found one. He didn't work out. What, what, what happened there? Um, you know, so I was 23 when we met, he was 36 because as a 23 year old, I had already had a level of success. I had a lot of ambitions. I had a lot of goals. It was really hard to find a 20 something year old guy with the same ambitions and goals. So I thought older, somebody that has established, had a business, but you know, we didn't know a lot of the things that we know now, you know, and it, especially a 23 year old, I certainly didn't know a lot of the things that I know now. And so I missed. And like I like what, I, what do you know now? I know that you should not rationalize any red flags in a relationship. I know that you should not fantasize about somebody's potential. I know that you should see somebody for who they are and not expect them to get better or change or grow or evolve. I know that you should never put up with abuse, whether that's emotional, physical, in any way. And I don't think that I knew that coming from the environment that I was in. Did you get abused? Yeah. It was a pretty... Physically? Um, once or twice, but... You know, was it most mental? Cops were there. I'm sorry. Was it mostly mental? Yeah, it was a lot of emotional. For somebody as that presents myself, I can't believe we're going here on this podcast already. For someone that presents myself, you, you've never heard my podcast. <laughs> I did, but I didn't think we were going to go here. Um, for someone that presents themselves as strong and independent, and I, I am those things, it was very embarrassing to allow that to happen because why didn't I see it? And you know, you mentioned something earlier when you were saying because you loved them, right? But you also rationalize it. Love is blind, though. Yeah, it is blind. But also coming, and you and you already said it. Like you, you were, you were, you loved the potential. Like, what yeah. if he could? What if he could have been this? And yeah. you know, what if I could just get him here? Yeah, it's almost like a project, right? And when you come from an abusive childhood, I think you find almost like sameness in a chaotic relationship and in a chaotic environment. And then when you're with someone older, then you start to second guess, like well, wait a minute, he must be right. I must be wrong. Like, okay, maybe I'm crazy. Like you start to second guess all of these things because you're told, just like you said, someone's chirping in your ear all the time. Like when you have someone chirping in your ear all the time that women shouldn't be strong and they should be quiet and they shouldn't have ambition and um, and you, you shouldn't want to achieve and grow, you start to listen to that. Is and that so what it, he say? That's yeah. what he would say? I mean, that's, that's some of it. Well, I mean, then why would he pick you? Exactly. Well, that, so this is the thing. When you mentioned this about men and women, about men being the providers, I think that there is a thing with men that, especially successful men, they might see a woman that's successful because it's different, right? I literally said to him on our third date, I'm not the type of girl that wants to get married. I'm never going to change my last name. I don't want to have kids. I want to build a, a company and like do something with my life. I just want to make sure you're okay. And he was like, yeah, let's go. This was what date? Third date. Why are you getting so serious so quick? Because I could kind of tell, like with him being older, I just wanted to be like honest with him, you know? Well, he, if he was a closer, he could have changed your mind on those <laughs> Well, I think that's what he thought. So then that is basically what happened. So then it was more of like, I was something to acquire. I wasn't actually what he ever wanted. And so then instead of just acknowledging that I was never something that he wanted, he tried to change me to be who he wanted me to be. And so then... Obviously, as a people pleaser and as a female, you want to do the right thing and you want to make your guy happy. And so I eventually changed and morphed into a different version of myself than I am now in order to kind of get through that relationship. And I think a lot of women do that. I think a lot of people do that in relationships for one reason or another. Um, 
And I'm just so grateful that eventually the pain of the unknown was less scary than the pain of what was. And then I was able to get out. How long were you guys married? Too long. We were together a total of 15 years. And how long? So how long ago has it, how long have you been free? Five years. So you're, so you're oh, way over it now. Six years. Oh my gosh. Yes. There's no still phone calls, booty calls. No, 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 no. Late, it was a hard stop. <laughs> late night texts. No. Cause you know what? It was one of those moments where, you know, I was so fearful, thankfully not financially. I know a lot of women that are in bad situations because financially they have to be, I wasn't in that situation. Thank God. But I still was so worried about public perception. You know, society still makes divorce and divorced women this like, you know, red X that you wear on your your shoulder. And so I was so worried about that, that I think between that and living in the area that we lived in and a lot of people looking down on divorce that I really thought, okay, I don't want to be one of those people. And so I traded a lot of my life, a lot of my time because of what people thought. And meanwhile, I was never that person. Like I never cared what people thought, especially a female. I had to not care because I was always paving the path and always being different than everybody else. But just anyone listening, that's one thing I would share is if you have a gut instinct or if you see a red flag, don't rationalize that. And by all means, anybody that's in an abusive situation, like you got to get out because it's probably far worse than you even realize. Cause when you're in the container, you can't really see it for how bad it is. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Matter of fact, I'll even give you the old bomb because no one should stay in an abusive relationship. I just sometimes question what people's perception of abuse is. Right. Because like, you know, sometimes it's like, dude, that ain't abuse. Right. You know, well, he said, you know, that I should lose some weight. That ain't, no, abuse. That ain't abuse. That ain't abuse. No. Like that's honesty. Right. I, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if my wife started to gain so much weight that I'm now not attracted to her, I would say to her, it's time for you to lose weight. It's time for you to go to the gym. You got to start coming to the gym with me. You got it. You can't be this way. And you can do that. You can to have, me, that's honesty though. Some people would say that that is abuse. No, no now if that's fat for, shaming, you're shaming her, Brad, Yeah. let her be her. I don't agree with that. I think two people should communicate. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes that communication's tough, Absolutely. especially if it comes to like, you know, guys who want open relationships, mm -hmm. I think you should communicate that. Yeah. And if they don't want to, and, and you end up divorced, then you should be. Why? Well, because, you know, they don't have to like the same things you like, but that's right. not abuse. Right. But anyway, I think that's the only thing I would, I would caveat with that and make people really pay I attention agree. to is, you know, don't just claim it's abuse. But if you're in an abusive relationship, an actual abusive relationship, physical, mental, emotional, doesn't matter. Yeah. You should get your ass out of it. Yeah. Before that happens. That's right. Because a lot of times, man, you could end up in, in a worse situation because you didn't leave. Absolutely. Like I know, I know of stories where women have killed their husbands mm. and vice versa. Yeah. Scary shit. It is. Think about it. So you got out of it though. Yeah. And I then know. you said, you said, you said you felt ashamed because you were too smart for that, but you got suckered in. Why would you, yeah. why would you care? Um, I just think again, it's sometimes we, unfortunately, as much as we're wired and uh, as achievers and as people that do things like we know not to do that, but you still sometimes get sucked into it. Of course right? you do. You know, especially so, but when, why beat yourself up over it? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't now, but yeah. I certainly did. I mean, now I'm in a great relationship. So it's allodoxophobia. Have you ever heard of that? No, no one ever does. No. Look it up. Is it the fear of other people's opinions? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's like everybody has it to yeah. some degree. Yeah. And if I could cure the world of allodoxophobia, I think we'd have a whole bunch more happy people in yeah. the world because most people's misery comes from other people's opinions. Yeah. It's the craziest thing I've ever it seen. Is. I'm cured of it. I don't really factor those in too much. Yeah. Like I say, everyone has it, including me. Yeah. But I think if we can get rid of that. So tell me about this business growth expert. If I want to grow Lightspeed VT, mm -hmm. would I hire you to come help me grow it? What would you, what, I mean, do you operate as a business growth expert? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, 
you know, I do more consulting role. It's I, I say I'm like, I'm never a coach because I'm the one that you're going to bring in and you're going to be like, hey, we're at X and we want to go to X. And for anyone listening that's an entrepreneur, like it's actually pretty easy to grow your business. Like you're either going to acquire new customers. You're going to get your existing customers to buy more from you. You're going to exi- get your existing customers to buy from you more frequently. And those two things are a lot cheaper than the first or you're going to raise your prices like all roads run through that. And it just depends on where you are. Do you have a customer acquisition strategy or are you just posting and hoping on the internet and allowing people to do word of mouth, but there's no strategy behind it. So, you know, do you have ancillary products and services that you can sell your existing customer? These are just all questions that oftentimes when you're in a business, you want to look at to see what someone's developed to know if you need to develop anything additional or if you just have a sales problem and you need to go get more customers because you're not been marketing or, you know, you haven't branded the company. Where, so, where did you learn this stuff? You know what? I think for me, it, well, I didn't learn any of this. I only went to high school. I never went to college. Um, obviously started a business at 19. But what I'm good at is identifying patterns for good or bad. And so I've really identified business patterns that they're all just broken down into these very simplistic things. And as entrepreneurs, we tend to overcomplicate it, but really the core fundamentals of business are very simple. And when we are remove the emotions, because oftentimes we get caught up in our heads about our businesses and we're highly emotional, but our feelings are not facts. The facts are the numbers and the data. And that's why we always go back to that in order to make better decisions. Do you think if someone doesn't know their numbers, there's any chance of success? Not unless they have someone in their business that is good at that. So if I could, if I could share with you that I am the example of that. But you have someone, you don't have a CPA or a book. Well, yeah, but nobody, nobody running things by the data. Right. Like sometimes I don't, I mean, I I pay more taxes than I'm supposed to. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I've done everything wrong, but a lot of times I watch shark tank and they go, you got to know your numbers. You got to know your numbers. If you said, Brad, I'll give you a million dollars if you can get these numbers right. And you said, what's your cost of acquisition? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What's your lifetime value for a customer? I don't know. Mm -hmm. What is your average? I don't know. Right. And I've never known. And I feel like you did for being in that dumb relationship. (laughs) Yeah. Because, because, you know, you need to know these things. I've been told that my whole career and and I'm like, okay, I'm going to, but. But that's because you're so good. Like sometimes people are so good at one aspect of their business that they are lucky that they get to almost ignore the other things, but not everybody is good, that good at sales. Like you're that good at sales and marketing that you can afford to overpay in taxes, that you can afford to not understand your customer data. But I promise you, if you knew those things, by you knowing all of that information, you oh, could be like a sniper instead of a machine gun going 100%. out and getting more of them. 100%. So what it helps like is- I, for, Like I almost want to hire you to come in and get those numbers for yeah. me. For people in the growth phase, what it does is it helps you grow more quickly, but really that that's not even it. It's almost not as valuable. Cause I always say when you're in growth, when you're trying to do maybe your first 10, three to 10 million, you can pretty much be really good at one thing. You could be good at giving a service. Your product can be really good. Your team can be good. You can be good at customer service, but when you really want to scale exponentially, the more, you know, that data, <clears throat> the more you can go out and sniper pick and you don't have to burn through capital to do it. So it's a much easier build and it creates a more sustainable model that someone's going to give you a higher return on EBITDA if they ever want to acquire your company, because now it's not dependent on you. If you're the best person in your organization, you're not going to get a big return when you go to exit, because now that buyer knows that they're not buying an investment, they're buying a job and no investor wants to do that. 100%. Yeah. So if someone goes to Candy Valentino, can they hire you to consult their organization? They can fill out an application and we go through like a vetting process because there's very specific, you know, You're not especially working with no scrubs. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what are the, what are the requirements? I prefer companies that are already doing at least a few seven figures because then I at least know that they have proof of concept. They have a team in place. Like anybody can get to a million dollars on their own in revenue. It's really hard to break through 3 million by just being an operator. <clears throat> so you've got to build a business. You have to build, you have to have people and processes to get there. And then once you're there, it's now it's optimization, right? Now it's really pulling the levers to know what growth. And what I think is great is like, you're a great example because you don't focus on that. 
So I like to be able to be like, oh, this would be great because I can come in and wow somebody because now I can save you probably millions in taxes by doing cost segregation and all of these different things and moving money into certain holding companies and trusts and stuff and then have quick wins that's going to have a, a return on your consulting fee that you'd be paying. So that's what I like. And I like that um, businesses that are established. So anybody listening that has established businesses that want to grow it, do you have any kind of guarantee? What if I pay you all this money and you come in and you can't grow it? That's never happened. That's never happened? It's never happened. Because if people just pull the right levers, things grow. Yeah, but they don't always know what, what levers to pull. And sometimes they don't have the capital to invest to pull those levers. So that's where we look at. We look at what someone already doing in their sales and marketing or do they have funnels? Do they have a sales team? Like, what are they already doing? What is the return on that? Because sometimes if you can't measure the effort, it's like, it's like putting money into a mutual fund and not knowing your return. Every dollar you put into a person or a process or a marketing component, whether that's Facebook ads or however you're acquiring customers, if you can't measure the ROI, you have no data to support if that was a good decision. So we need to see if what you're doing instinctively as a business owner, which is how everybody operates in the beginning, is getting you an ROI on that dollar, that soldier that's going out and trying to get more people to come to your organization. So we do that by looking at people. What are the returns on your person? Like every single person in your organization should be, depending on what you're paying them, and it depends on industry, but generally speaking, they should be bringing in about $250,000 in revenue per head. Because if you're paying someone seventy five dollars or 100000 oftentimes they look at it as a support staff, and then they're not getting any money on that money, but people are investments in your business too, just like a Facebook or a LinkedIn campaign. So we start to measure all of those things to say, okay, Brad, look, You've been doing all of this time and all of this marketing. And we even measure your time. Like you're putting this much time into your podcast. You're putting this much time into YouTube. What's the, what's the return on that to say, well, you know what? The one thing that's giving you 80% of the results is this. Let's double down on that. And now you're going to grow exponentially. And that's when I get excited because then like I like things to happen fast and quickly so I can really move people quick. Hey, you want to spend an hour a week with me helping you become a business badass? Well, check out my group in the link below. Smart. You know, uh, I think it was you, but someone said earlier, you know, how are you monetizing this? Or how are you? That was you my know, first question. <laughs> are you creating leads from it? And I'm like, no, not really. I wanted to build it first. Yeah. That's the type of thing I'm talking about. Like I, you could come in here and say, Brad, this podcast you have, you could be doing a thousand percent more business just by utilizing and leveraging the podcast, which exactly. I hardly ever do. People usually will say, I didn't know you had a training system. I didn't know you had this mm -hmm. and that and the other thing because I don't take advantage. Right. It's almost like I'm afraid to get bigger. And why is that? Not literally. It just seems that way. Why? Well, why don't I say, and then this podcast is brought to you by one of my companies. And by the way, if you're in need of da, 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 I always just think to my, I, I just don't think of it. Like yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm having a conversation with you right now. I don't realize this is an episode. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking of the customer of the listener. I'm thinking about what, what do I want to ask you and mm -hmm. what, what does that lead me to? And, right. and then at the end I realize, oh yeah, there's going to be people listening to this. And so, you know, now I'm starting to get a little, a little bit more prepared mm -hmm. and, and ready to start leveraging all of my, I call them assets. Right. Cause it's like you said in your training program, right? You have within the training program, if you like this, you can go here and join this mastermind. Or if you like this, like you have that baked in, all you're doing is taking that same mechanism and doing it in this format. Because unfortunately what happens is if people don't start doing an ROI on their time, they start just doing shit that doesn't matter. They start majoring in minor things. They think they build a business, but what they often actually created was a job. If you're not intentionally That's terrible. It is, but I see it all the time. People think that they're a business owner and an entrepreneur. And I'm like, bro, you're self-employed. Like if you don't show up to work tomorrow, 
you're not getting you're paid, done. your people aren't getting paid. You're, there is no company. You built yourself a job. And I want to caveat that, that that's okay. Like my dad was self-employed mechanic. Like he didn't want to have people to manage. He hated having to tell people what to do and look after their work when they were fixing on cars. There's nothing wrong with being self-employed, but you got to know what you're building and you have to have that vision of your life. Like, do you just want to do this forever? Cause at some point, if you don't have an exit, like I did, like if, that someone pays you for an asset that you built, you're just going to put a sign on the door that says closed and then you're not going to do it anymore. Or you're going to give it to one of your kids or like, what is the intention behind what you're building? And when we have that vision, we can reverse engineer all of the different components and fundamentals and valves that we need to turn in order for you to get there. How many zeros did you get when you exited? Uh, A lot, but I actually undervalued. So this is another thing. And this is why I think I'm passionate about it. One of the reasons I'm passionate about number one, when I was very early in my business, I learned that less than 2% of all female entrepreneurs ever break a million dollars. Okay. Less than 2%, a million dollars in revenue, not even net. Yeah. But believe it or not, I read somewhere, very few businesses even reach a million. Yeah. It's like, really? I don't really, I used to know the specifics of all businesses, but what's ingrained in my head and I wrote about in the book was it was 2%. And of that 2%, get this, less than one half of 1% of all of that 2% will ever exit. So me, I looked at it as opposed to seeing the 98% that never broke a million and the 99.5% that never exited. I looked at like, well, what about the 2%? What do I need to do to be in the 2%? What do I need to do to be in the point half percent? And I was very grateful to be around a, a group of women in my early 20s that were all doing $2 million of revenue and more. And I basic, I barely got a seat at the table. Like I just squeaked in because of somebody that brought me on as a friend. And I learned so much from these women that were doing 30, 50, $100 million in revenue that instead of looking at, and I think this is something everyone does, rather than seeing all the people that don't do it or they're not successful or they're not billionaires or they don't achieve this goal they're after, what about the people that do? Like there is proof all around us that you can be successful. And every story we hear about people successful have overcome some shit. They've done some things. They made stupid mistakes, but yet they still move forward. And I think that's something so important for everyone listening, wherever you are, there's proof all around you that you can do it too. You're the only one that's stopping you. Another fact. (laughs) So this financial analyst to me, when I hear the word analyst, that's what's make confusing me. Like you look at people's numbers and then give them some sort of report. So financial analysts, if I'm being fully transparent, I think started popping up because I started writing about investing and they're like, well, really you're, you're a financial analyst. And I was like, okay, am I, you know, like I don't have a degree for any of these things. So when someone gives you a title, I'm like, I guess I've been investing in, in wealth for 20 some years. So, okay. But I guess there is an angle there because when I work with someone, you've got to, ha- I, I look at the numbers. Like I sit with someone, we talk about it, but then I want to see your P and L's. I want to see your balance sheet. I want to see. What are those? <laughs> that is what someone should look at every single month in their state of the union meeting. So anyone listening, if you don't know what that is, it's something I, I wrote about in my book. <laughs> you guys don't know what that is. Stop <laughs> listening and, and go to work. Yes. Every single month, if you did nothing but this. So anyone that thinks, your numbers are scary. I don't know all this data. I don't want to learn any of this. If you just started with this, set a two hour date with yourself, go to your favorite coffee shop, hotel, wherever you like to go, take your PL, your balance sheet, any of your S- uh, CRM information or your POS, whatever you're using to run your business, take your bank reconciliations and start to just look at the numbers. What it's about like cash flow statement? Cash flow statement too. Yeah, income statement, cash flow. Um, Take that in there. It's just like going to the gym. If you want to get a great body or you want to run a marathon, you got to take the first mile. You got to pick up the first five pound weight. If you don't ever do this and start to just digest your numbers and understand what they are, not only does it inhibit your growth, but it opens you up to embezzlement, which I was embezzled from. And you you never think you will be. You never think you will. And I was like, I love this. Numbers are my thing. So I loved my numbers and I still missed it. I still reviewed every single month with my consumer controller who was a full-time account. I still reviewed all of the stuff with him. I hired a controller here one time and she gave herself a raise. Oh yeah. Because did she have power to sign checks too? 
No. So how'd she do it? It's automatic. Oh. Like I, I, when I sign payroll, I see 362,000. I don't see everybody's individual right. shit. So it wasn't significant enough to spike it for you to look? Oh, it wasn't that much, yeah. but still, dude, you, yeah. you gave yourself a raise? Right. Like that's embezzlement. That's embezzlement. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't, you can't give yourself a raise. Yeah, absolutely. So, but you know, somebody told me I was 21 years old. He was a real estate investor in the small little town that I was in. His name's Rick. And I was in his office and I was talking about all these things that I wanted to do. And he had billboards. I was starting to do billboards. I was starting this whole marketing campaign. Because again, late 90s, early 2000s, we didn't have the digital marketing like we have now. So it was billboards and radio and TV and newspaper. And I was doing this six-figure campaign because I was going all in. And I remember him sitting there and he's been in business a long time. And I said, what are some of the things that you would tell me now? Which is kind of why the question I ask at the end of my podcast are, what would you do now if you lost it all? What are some of the mis mistakes you've made, the, the advice you would give? He said, Candy, no matter what you do, always sign your own checks. He had a family friend, like a person that he took on vacation with, felt like a, a grandmother or a mother to him for 25 years. It was just taken a little a little, a little off the top. And that little turned into half a million, almost a million, somewhere in that range that he just wasn't seeing because he wasn't paying attention because he allowed someone else to sign. Still to this day, nobody does a wire without me looking at it. I still sign checks if they go out. I still review because no one will care about your money more than you. Period. So if you're not, what if at you least, have a partner, then you or your partner, or do you get double check your partner? I, if you and I were business partners and I trusted you hundred percent, I would still be looking because the number one reason businesses fail outside of sales and money is bad partnerships. So I would still be reviewing and I would make it fun. I'd be like, Hey, we're going to do this, you know, every, every month we're going to sit down. Let's do it in Cabo. Yeah, exactly. And write it off because <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> so then those are all the fun things, you know, um, we always talk about like with receipts, like making sure that God forbid you ever have red flags or you get an audit that everything is customary and usual for your industry that you can justify any expenses that you take. These well, are all things people don't think about when they're building because they're just looking at a transactional number that they want to grow. What the brain can't measure is what you can lose. From a lawsuit, from fraud, from fire, because you're not t paying attention to your insurance and you're underinsured, which I also did. So there's so many mistakes and missteps that people miss because they're just focused on revenue growth. But there's a lot of things, in, including revenue growth, that we can prevent you from, from happening within your business, that those things are what will cripple it to the ground. Pretty smart, aren't you? <laughs> oh, Candy Valentino. <laughs> Um, well, we'll I wish, that. I wish you weren't so good, but then I probably wouldn't want to hire you. I'm looking, I just need somebody, by the way, if anybody's listening, I'm looking for specifically right now, a controller. Mm -hmm. Cause like I, cause to make my point, I've never really worried about the numbers. I always thought when they get big enough, I'll worry about them. Mm -hmm. Like who cares? Like what, what, what what's going to happen? Then they got fairly decent sized and I'm like, you know, eh. Who cares? I'll, I'll, you know, who cares? But now I'm getting to the point where I do care and I am starting to get these numbers yeah. and I'm starting to realize some things like, man, I should have been doing this from day one. I bet you I would have missed or I missed a ton of stuff and I would have saved a ton of stuff had I been paying attention. We have like, I, I provide alcohol for employees. Okay. Beer, alcohol. Okay. Why? Well, it's not against the law. If they want to have a drink, have one. Yeah. But so I supply it. Well, I keep seeing, you know, this beer budget basically increase. Mm -hmm. And to a point where it's like, you know, how much do we spend on beer? I didn't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. How much do we spend on office supplies? I don't know. So I'm looking for a controller right now. And that mm -hmm. whole role is going to be every dime in, where'd it come from? Who'd it come from? Mm -hmm. And every dime out, what was it for? And who spent it? Yeah. I want to know these things. And you should. And I want my reports at the end of the month. And then I can start saying, hey, wait a minute. Are we really spending, you know, $9,000 on toilet paper every month? Because mm -hmm. you never know how you get stole from. Oh, my gosh. It, it, it could be, it could be you know, someone else's Sam's Club order. It could be someone else's Sam's I've Club order. One time, matter of fact, I got a bill. This was years ago. And somebody went to uh, Lowe's or 
Home Depot or something with a light speed credit card. I'm like, why do we even have a light speed credit card at Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever it was? And somebody opened up a credit card and charged like $19,000 worth of uh, backyard furniture. Mm -hmm. So two things. Uh, and by the way, never found out who did it. Crazy. It is crazy. I'm paying attention now. And, and whoever's listening should be paying attention. And if you don't know how to pay attention, I would say call Candy. You, can you teach people how to pay attention? Yeah. I was on your website earlier. I saw... I, unlike you, I don't do much research. Why? Because I like to discover on the on yeah. the podcast. Right. I like to really. I normally do that, but with you, I wanted. I just feel like you had so much experience. I wanted to make sure to unpack it. But you you said something. I want to make sure your audience catches, because you said something. When I get bigger, I'll worry about my numbers, and it's the same thing you tell people not to do about their training programs. You say. Don't do a pro training program once you have a bunch of people. Do it now once you're little. If people would develop these skills now and they have a little, it will not only grow your business, but it's two-sided. It'll help you keep more of your money. 100%. And that's what I did well. I wasn't the smartest. I wasn't the talent, most talented. I have no education whatsoever. I just paid attention to a few valves. And I knew that if I continued to grow and I maintained an increased profitability, then I could take money out of my business and invest it into other assets. Because I read a book, Naive Enough at 19, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and Think and Grow Rich, that you need assets and cash flow. So that's what I went out and did. And by doing that, I was able to compound time where most people have to work till they're 65, 70. I made work optional by the time I was 40 because I was growing the business, pulling out profit and investing it into assets that cash flowed. And the only way that you can ever make work optional is to have assets that pay you because if you create a job for yourself and not a business, you will work for the rest of your life. I didn't know you had all these sound effects. <laughs> and that is the truth. And again, <laughs> I am a late bloomer. I've just discovered in the last three to four years everything you just said. Even though I hung around Grant Cardone for, because mm -hmm. he preaches that. Yeah. And he's been doing it diligently for years. Yeah. That's, that's what's making him, you know, 99% of his success is from that. And really, it's the other way. Like you said, you probably are paying too much in tax. It's a way to lower your tax basis. Like the tax code has been around the same way forever and ever, which is you're always going to pay your highest amount of tax on earned income, active income from your business. But if you can take that out and put it into cash flowing assets, you're going to pay less taxes. And eventually, depending on your debt ratio and all of that, you're going to pay no taxes if you do it right or very little, depending on what you got. Where do you live? Sarah, uh, Scottsdale, <laughs> Arizona. Yeah. Is that where you, I've always been? No, I'm originally from Pittsburgh. So why there? Why Sarah, why Scottsdale? I mean, um, you keep wanting to say I Sarasota. Know, I know. Who you know, lives there? I don't even know. No. So it's weird. When Somebody I was, lives there. No one lives there. Why um, do you keep the saying Ritz Carlton's it? there. So when I was, um, moving from Pittsburgh, I could move anywhere because I didn't have kids. I was divorced. I was, I exited the business. I had real estate investment properties. Like I was just like, where do you want to go candy? And so Sarasota was one of the places I was thinking about. Puerto Rico was one California. Thank God I didn't go there. No offense to anybody that lives there, but all of the people I knew were in California and I didn't like it. And I would travel to Scottsdale all the time. And I just, I just love it. Like, I love Scottsdale it. Scottsdale's cool. It's awesome. Like, I love the people. Everybody's from somewhere else. So it's really easy to, like, meet people and make connections. The women there are awesome. It's like um, where before is if you kind of didn't, if you weren't the norm of everybody else, you kind of, like, got talked about or stood out too much. Where Scottsdale, like, everybody cares about health and the way they look and being successful and all of that. So, um, it's a different, it's a different vibe for sure, but I, I love it. I really love it. So, so if people are listening, they're like, dude, I like this girl. Where, where do I pick up her book? Is it like Amazon everywhere? It normally everywhere. Is? It's a published book. Yeah. So. It's called wealth habits. Mm -hmm. And I assume you go over the habits of the wealthy. Yeah. Six ordinary things that anyone can do to create extraordinary financial freedom, because I think that's what everyone's after. So real quick, let's talk about that. What are the six things? It's crazy. I had the sacred six. Now you have six things. I know, right? Are you copying me? <laughs> no, <laughs> but I'll tell you that everything boils down to these six habits. Cause if we can change your beliefs about money, we can change the discipline that you have. And then that your actions, your, will change your habits and your yeah. behaviors, right? See, so, that's why I said earlier. Am I right? You're right. You're right. So the thing is with money is a lot of it 
It's not what we were taught along the way. We caught it in our environment. We caught it by the way our parents interacted with money, by what was happening in our childhood, by whether there was a lot or a little, which can actually have poor beliefs about money on both sides. So the very first step we need to tackle with wealth habits to create it is we need to unpack all of the broke BS beliefs that you have, and we need to reprogram that with what's true. Is that our, in the book? That's in the book. Because our minds are not wired to be successful, to create wealth, it's wired to keep us safe. And you have to take risks in order to start a business. You have to take risks to have investments. That's the opposite of safety. So our brains are trying to keep us safe. Your families are trying to keep you safe. Society's trying to keep you safe, AKA holding you back. The government's trying to keep us safe. Right, uh, are they? <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. But we gotta rewire what you believe to know that money's kind of like Las Vegas. Money is going to amplify who you are. Vegas is going to amplify who you are and what you want to experience here. If you are a kind giving person, the more money you make, the more you're going to be able to do that. If you're an asshole, the more money you make, the bigger the asshole you're going to be. So we have to first reprogram that money is not evil. It is not bad. It is a vehicle that can give you the freedom to bless whoever you want, go wherever you want, do whatever you want. But it's the only way that you can really truly have freedom in your life, that you're not punching a clock or you're responsible for filling out a slip to, to take a vacation with your family. Then from there, we go into self-education. And it's interesting, you touched on it because I have a whole, this is a whole habit in the book about always learning, always evolving, always continuing your knowledge. Even if the smartest person right now thinks that they don't need to learn, they will never continue to grow, evolve, or increase their net worth. You always have to be learning new things. So I take them through a framework of good quality self-education because I don't have any fancy education. Then we go into earning your way to more wealth, which of all of the Forbes 400 richest people that I researched for the book, 75% of them all had one thing in common. They or their family had money from a business. So three-fourths of all of the richest people in the world created wealth first through a business. So we break down how to actually earn more money so that you can then save money to invest. Then we talk about cash flowing assets, how to invest, and then the final piece, because this is something that I did, about how to give your way to more wealth. You know, I started a nonprofit when I was 26. I donated the use of a building that I own to the charity. We've saved tens of thousands of animals' lives to date, and we help have programs for at-risk youth, kids are in the foster system, and kids that are abused. So we rescue and heal animals, and then through their stories, we rescue and heal humans to end the abuse cycle. And so it's all about contribution. I think it was uh, Tony Robbins is more credited to doing it in this, and he does a phenomenal job with it in this generation, but Maslow's work on the six habits, um, I'm sorry, of the um, six human needs, um, was really instrumental because, you know, you've got significance that everybody, especially right, Vegas and successful people are trying to get significance and ego. We've got certainty, we've got uncertainty, we've got love and connection, and then we've got growth and contribution. But what Maslow missed, and I don't think anyone, we, we searched to make sure that this was my work. The one thing that I found was that there's only one human need that provides all of the others for you, and that's contribution. When you contribute and you give to something beyond yourself, something happens and shifts that creates significance in your life. It creates certainty because you, you know you're making a difference. It creates uncertainty because you're doing all these new things. And it creates a love and a connection that you can't receive without first giving. And it creates a lot of growth. And so we talk about that and how to make a pledge to, to give 10% of your money, to give 10% of your time, and to eventually give 10% of your wealth at your death. That's like a tithe. Right. What is yeah. your spirituality? I believe in God. Um, you know, I always say to whatever that means to somebody else, no judgment. But, you know, I've always tried to deepen that relationship with, with Christ and, and to walk the walk. And Do you know his name? I'm sorry? Do you know his name? Well, they call him Jesus Christ, but. <laughs> What's his name? Um, Yahweh? Is that his actual? That's the big guy's name. That's the big guy's name. I don't know. Yeah. Well, what is that, it? That's more than most people know. What is it? Yahshua. Yashua. Yashua. Some people will say it's Yeshua, but whatever. Yeah. Yashua. Yashua. Yeah. Good. So so that's interesting. You're a smart cookie. <laughs> now, a lot of people would say, Brad, that's like what do you call it? Chauvinistic to say cookie. I would have said that to anybody. Oh, I didn't I didn't pick up on it. But you're smart. 
you're smart. And, and what's funny is, you know, it usually takes a lot of experience to get these kind of smarts. So that's why I like started this podcast is to get the knowledge from the people who have it to the people who need it. Cause a lot of times, man, they're just missing the right information. Mm -hmm. That's why they're paying too much in taxes. That's nobody sat me down when I started this company and said, Brad, let me mentor you. Let me show you the way I probably wouldn't have listened anyway. Um, but I wish someone would have, and you know, I'm going to get your book and read it because in my mind, I just said this the other day, if you really want to be successful, it's going to boil down to three things, your mindset, mm -hmm. your skill set, and your habits. Yep. So wealth habits is something I need to get into. I just started discovering, you know, cash flow, passive mm -hmm. cash flow. Yeah. And now I'm like, you know, what else can I get? You know, storage facilities, yeah. you know, uh, apartment buildings, but what else is there? I, I'm starting to get into that now, now that I'm getting old. Well, if you have, if you want to buy a storage facility, I have one for sale. So, Do you really? Yeah. Why are you selling it? Um, my dad, my dad and I are involved in it. It's a long story, but with his health and stuff, he's been the one that's always like handled it back in Pennsylvania. Um, and with him being in a really bad, can you send me the, the, yeah, the, the deal? You. Yeah. Yeah. I'll send it to you. I'd be interested. They're like rare, really hard to come by. So can I get a good deal? Or are you going to whack me? <laughs> I'll show you how to write it off <laughs> and not pay anything for it. If you do it by the end of the year. Now, so those are now nice how can the bomb squad help you? You know what? Um, I'm so grateful that I just have the ability to help people. Like, that's why I do this. I don't, as much as I was listening to you, I probably need a training program. I don't really have any of that. I have the book. Um, I've got a podcast. I've got a show coming out next year. So What's your podcast called? It's called it's, Generation Wealth it's with Candy Valentino? It's going to be changed to Candy Valentino Show. Candy Valentino Show. Yeah. And people, obviously, you can follow her at Candy Valentino on social media. Yeah. And if you want, obviously, help with your business and you fall into some of those parameters, that's what I love to do. I love to help people in a very fiduciary level because, you, like you said, you can get a controller that needs to make money and wants to take some of the beans for themselves. But when you operate from a fiduciary standpoint and you do it with what's best, so that's the way I operate. We do it as if it's my business, what's best for the business. I don't get any percentages on anything unless it's an equity deal, um, which those are fun too. But there's so many ways that good people, smart people are losing money because they're either overpaying or not paying attention to the right things. And there's no shame in that. Like nobody, obviously like you're so great at sales. You could teach me so many things about sales teams and all this stuff that I have no knowledge of. So it's not that you need to be good at all of these things, but you need to be surrounded by people that are good with all of these things. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, you know, again, I don't, I, I haven't looked at your website long enough, but like you might have accidentally found a client as well. <laughs> I appreciate you coming in. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. I really appreciate this. Folks. CandyValentino.com at Candy Valentino or go get her book, Wealth Habits. As always, till next time, keep it real. I mean, honestly, in hindsight, my favorite business has been, I think, personal brand. If you can do it, it's so cool because now I, I go to Iceland, it's business. So I think oh, I, my favorite business in hindsight, because I've tried lots of stuff, huge e com businesses, I've done real estate, I've done podcasts and all this. I think just a personal, if you can get the ultimate, is if you can get paid to just live life and film it. You know, that's, I mean, that's a tough one to beat.
we're talking vertical integration. It'd be like me becoming the marketing company where I have paid marketing services for my downline agents as well. So I'm actually making money on the marketing side as well. It's you like should. us you making money on the technology side by being able to sell our technology to people that aren't in our hierarchy. Yeah, but you should be. I, I, we are, we're working on, we, we are doing that. Yeah. We're I mean, if you, that. if you, if you do it right, believe it or not, your 450 agents are your customers. Yeah. 